my name is Celie and welcome back to the Low Readers Corner. Today I am doing a book haul. So my last book haul was right before I moved, which was really fun because then my mom had to send me all of those books. It's been a wild last few months. And what's our favorite coping mechanism? Book buying. So I have purchased quite a few books. I had a feeling it was a lot more books than I thought it was, and I was right. Um, I have 40 books in this book haul. So I guess we're going to get started. I do have them organized right now on my TBR cart right here. Oh, so I have them organized by fantasy sci-fi, basically just not set in our world. And then contemporaries, a couple books that are different editions from ones I already own. So yes, I bought the same book twice or thrice in some cases. And then I have graphic novels and poetry. But without further ado, let's get going into some of these books. Let's first start with the books that I already own in a different format. <laughs> Love that, don't we? So I bought the paperback of Juliet Takes a Breath by Gabby Rivera. So this is one of my favorite books of all time and I own it in three different versions now. basically the same story don't worry about it it's fine i really love this book so much so i first read it in this beautiful hardcover edition look at that oh my goodness and absolutely loved it read it within a few days fantastic made my mom read it made jade read it who doesn't even read contemporaries really and yet she still loved it this is a wonderful story about juliet who is a lesbian puerto rican who lives in the bronx and she gets this amazing internship opportunity to intern for her favorite feminist author in portland she gets there and it is not exactly what she thought it would be. She deals with a lot of different difficult circumstances when she gets there, but ultimately this is kind of a coming of age story, not really. It's more of finding yourself and becoming the truest version of yourself that you can be. And I absolutely love it. It is fantastic, it is wonderful, it is empowering, it is so inclusive of so many different identities, and it's just so good. So I have it in this hardcover, I have it as the graphic novel adaptation, which, look at that, it is absolutely beautiful, oh my goodness. And now I have it in this gorgeous paperback edition. I mean, come on. Look at that. How could I not? I was at the bookstore. I was having a rough day. I saw it and I was like, you know what? 10 bucks for me to feel ultimate joy by having <laughs> three versions of my favorite story. Why not? So I did that. The next duplicate purchase that I made was a graduation gift to myself. It was something that I had seen I think like a year ago and somehow it was not sold out yet and that story is this is how you lose the time war this is written by amal el motar and max gladstone and i think it was either illumicrate or lit joy Pray. pretty sure it was illumicrate did this limited edition box set of the same book twice don't ask me but it's wonderful and i thought they had been sold out already yes this is the exact same book just two different versions but it was still available and i was like you know what after the year i just had and i read this is how you lose the time war during quarantine and it was just it was just wonderful it was everything i needed i love this story so gosh darn much so yes i purchased it again in two different versions if you don't know what the story is about it is a time travel story it is one of my absolute favorite time travel stories it is set in this futuristic world where there are time travel agents and there are two specific time travel agencies and there are two time travel agents blue and red and they are in this battle across timelines. Both of their agencies are trying to create the timeline that they prefer, that they think would be best. They come across each other in multiple different timelines in different places, different time periods, everything. Absolutely love this story so much and I just feel so complete 
having three copies of the same book. It's fine, don't worry about it. I'm having a good time. <laughs> now this next one I don't technically own already, I do, but I own it as an audiobook, and that is Yes Please by Amy Poehler. This is her memoir, the audiobook, absolutely fantastic and a lot of the times amy would mention pictures that would be in the physical copy which you know is like a very clever way for the author of the book to try to get you to purchase another copy of their book which you know worked and i just really want to read this and experience it again but in a different way like we all want to be able to reread our favorite books for the second time and now i kind of can this is one of my favorite memoirs it she talks about her life before she got into acting while she was in high school while she starts off her acting career and then of course later there's a lot of really funny anecdotes and just stories about life struggles and personal things. And it's just good. Actually, I do have one more double copy of a book and that is this hardcover edition of The Secret History by Donna Tartt. I got this on as an add-on, I think, at Book of the Month. It was only $10. I did read this paperback version of it last year year when I was doing a dark academia reading vlog that took three months because this book took forever to read because I loved it and I was taking my sweet darn time with it and I just really wanted this beautiful hardcover edition of it. Look at that. Wow. It is a dark academia book about these students who are going to this east coast brick university. They are students in the Greek program and they have this really intense professor and at some point a murder occurs and they are trying to make sure that they aren't going to jail for the murder. Good stuff. Now I have the perfect transition in between my duplicate copies and my graphic novels. So my graduation and my commencement ceremony were kind of different events because I was supposed to graduate in March except my commencement wasn't until literally yesterday when I'm filming this in June. So, you know, um, I did kind of celebrate my graduation twice, which, you know, for getting a bachelor's degree, I think is highly valid. So for yesterday, I marked the occasion by getting the three hardcover versions of my favorite graphic novel series of all time. It's tied as my favorite graphic novel series of all time. Check Please, I have the hardcover editions of Check Please also coming in, that's a whole different situation. But I'm talking about Giant Days. Giant Days is my favorite. Oh my goodness. It's basically about these three girls who start off university. They have completely different personalities and interests, but they become friends and it's just about their lives in university. I have never felt so seen by a story than in Giant Days. They are just going through all of the highs and lows of university, all of these things happening, and it's just wonderful. I love it so freaking much. But I got these beautiful editions. This is volume one, it's fall semester. And then we have volume two of the Not on the Test edition. This is winter? Yes, winter. And then volume three of the Not on the Test edition. And this is spring. So they are just so beautiful. Look at them. I literally spent 15 minutes. I kid you not, 15 minutes last night just sitting on my bed hugging these additions because they gave me so much life. Look at those little, look how cute they are. They just, they just make me feel very warm and fuzzy, okay? That's what it is. And along those same lines, I initially read all of Giant Days all online. You can read them for free on Kindle Unlimited and Comixology. So I recently got volume two and volume three. I am just so flippin' happy that these two were slightly discounted. Usually they're $15 each, which is a lot, especially because they're pretty short, but I love them so gosh darn much. So yes, these are basically the same as what I got for the hardcover edition. Just, just don't worry about it, it's fine. Not your problem, it's all good. Moving on to more graphic novels, I picked up the first two volumes of Paper Girls. I have been wanting to pick these up for some time, but yet again, for graphic novels, I prefer to be pretty certain if I'm going to love them because 
usually pretty expensive. I've been hearing from a lot of people that this is a really great series. I've heard from some people that they didn't like it as much, so I wasn't so sure. And I found these at a used bookstore. This one was $3, this one was $5. So I was like, you know what? <laughs> Now is the time. Hopefully I really like them, but either way. I'm pretty sure this is about a group of girls who have a paper route. Yeah, early hours after Halloween 1988, four 12 year old newspaper delivery girls uncover the most important story of all time. Suburban drama, supernatural mysteries collide in nostalgia. So it sounds like a good time. Probably gonna do these for a reading vlog at some point. I think it'll be fun. Then I also recently got volume two of Heartstopper. I am completely caught up on Heartstopper on the webcomic and I've been wanting to collect the physical editions of them as well because I really love Heartstopper. If you haven't heard about Heartstopper, I doubt you haven't, but it's basically about these two boys who go to the same school and they fall in love and it's about them and their friends and their story and about them fi figuring out who they are and how they fit into the world and it's wonderful. And then the only poetry <laughs> collection that I have to show in this physical haul today is Great Goddesses Life Lessons from Myths and Monsters and this is written by Nikita Gill. I'm reading this for a Greek god retelling video that is coming out at some point in the future. If you're interested I do have my TBR for it as a separate video. I won't be reading all of the books that I talked about in that TBR video, but I talk about all of the Greek God inspired stories slash retellings that I'm interested in in that video. So I'll link that down below. It's a good time, you can check it out. But this is basically feminist poetry based off of the stories of the gods and heroes of Olympus and Greek mythology. Sounds like a gosh darn good time. I mean, first off, the cover is beautiful. And now let's move on to the high fantasy, sci-fi fantasy, not in our world books. First in this stack, I have A Peculiar Peril, and this is written by Jeff Vandermeer. It looked really interesting, but I wanted to look into it a little bit more. And then I saw it on Book Outlet for like $4. And I was like, come on, $4? Please, can you hear those crows? I think I've been cursed. Oh gosh. I mean, come on. There is a um, black Sharpie dot. All books from Book Outlet have either like a Sharpie dot or a Sharpie line because they are the... These book, these crows are messing with me. Because... Because they are the... Do I need to scream at some crows? I will. That actually worked. <laughs> As I was saying, a peculiar peril. This sounds really wonky and honestly, I'm very much here for it. In this strange wonder-filled epic, Jonathan Lamb's head stands to inherit his deceased father's overstuffed mansion, a veritable cabinet of curiosities. Once he and two schoolmates catalog its contents, but the three soon discover that the house is filled with far more than just oddities. It holds clues linking to an alternate earth called Aurora, where the notorious English occultist has seized power on a magic field rampage across a through the looking glass version of Europe, replete, re replete, replete with talking animals and vegetables. And it just keeps going on. I mean, if that doesn't give you a taste of what this is, I think this could be either absolutely phenomenal or just completely whack. So either way, a win. Next, I have The Unbroken by C.L. Clark. This is the first book that I purchased when I got here. I have started reading it, but I first need to just knock out all of the other books on my TBR because I am currently reading way too many things. So I haven't gotten too far into this, but so far it is fantastic. This is also one of the books on my 2021 anticipated releases. So I am so excited to have it, to read it. This is about Terrain, who is a soldier and was stolen as a child and raised to kill and die for the empire. She owes loyalty to only her fellow conscripts, but now her company has been sent back to her homeland to stop a rebellion and the ties of blood may be stronger than she thought. Luca needs a turncoat, someone desperate enough to tiptoe the bayonet's edge between treason and orders. Someone who can sway the rebels towards peace while Luca focuses on what really matters, getting her uncle off her throne. 
Also, may I just say that I have read a couple of the first chapters and the writing is just beautiful and fantastic in this one. Literally the other day, I purchased The Jasmine Throne and this is written by Tasha Suri. Also one of my anticipated releases of this year. I am so excited to be holding this. Oh my goodness, I cannot wait. This sounds phenomenal. Trapped by her despotic brother within the crumbling walls of the ancient temple, Princess Malini dreams of vengeance. Forced to disavow her birthright and her power because of her past, maidservant Priya dreams of freedom. In a world beset by wild magic and turbulent uprising, their destinies will become irrevocably tangled and together they will set an empire ablaze. I can't wait. This sounds so good. I've heard only fantastic things about Tasha Suri's past work like Empire of Sand. Oh, I'm excited. This next one is also one of my 2021 anticipated releases and that is The Ones We're Meant to Find by Joan Ha. This one sounds so cool. It is dystopian and has these really cool familiar connections and I think there is an android. Let me just read you the synopsis. Oh my goodness. Also, can we just... Can we just look at this cover? So first off, we have the actual dust jacket. Beautiful, gorgeous. Then we have the naked cover and spine. Absolutely drop dead gorgeous. Then we have the end pages. Look at that. Look at that. Gorgeous. Oh my goodness. And then we have the synopsis. I mean, it just doesn't. It doesn't get better than this. It truly does not. This is, this is it right here. It's been three years and 17 days since C woke up on the shore of an abandoned island. She has no idea how she came to be marooned or what her life was like before. She has only the rickety house by the sea, the android she built for company, and a single memory. Somewhere beyond the horizon, she has a sister, and it's up to C to escape the island and find her. A world away, 16-year-old STEM prodigy Casey is also looking to escape from the science she once believed in and from her home. The eco-cities, Earth's last unpolluted habitats, are meant to be a sanctuary for those from deserving lineages, for those committed to planetary protection, but instead they're populated by people willing to do anything for refuge, even lie. After a series of man-made disasters rock the planet, Casey must decide if she's ready to use science to help humanity, even though it failed the people who mattered most to her. I mean... I am so excited to read this one. Next we have, <laughs> you guessed it, another anticipated release of 2021. It just doesn't end. That is Project Hail Mary by Andy Weir. Andy Weir, I have gone on this rant many, many times, but Andy Weir is just phenomenal at creating a very believable world. These worlds aren't even that far from the worlds we currently inhabit. Just the way that he creates this plausible science that makes his stories actually very plausible is so cool. And here is another one. If you don't know anywhere, The Martian, Artemis, there you go. Also, The Martian movie and The Martian book, of course, are pretty different. So if you're basing the plausibility off of the movie, Read the book first. A lone astronaut, an impossible mission, an ally he never imagined. Do we need to know more? Do you even want to know more? Like that's, that's it right there. Yeah, so he's the sole survivor on a desperate last chance mission. And if he fails, humanity and earth itself will perish. Great. <laughs> Sounds like a wild ride. Okay, last one in this section, and that is Ariadne, and this is written by Jennifer Saint. I already talked about this in my Greek god myth retelling video, so if you want more information, you can check that out. But this is a more feminist retelling of Ariadne, the princess of Crete. Let's just have a little look at this synopsis. Ariadne, the princess of Crete, grows up reading the dawn with from her beautiful dancing floor and listening to her nursemaid stories of gods and heroes. But beneath her golden palace echo the ever-present hoofbeats of her brother, the Minotaur, a monster who demands a blood sacrifice. When Theseus, the prince of Athens, arrives to vanquish the beast, Ariadne sees in his green eyes not a threat, but an escape. 
Defying the gods, betraying her family and country, and risking everything for love, Ariadne helps Theseus kill the Minotaur. But will Ariadne's decision ensure her happy ending? And what a Phaedra, the beloved sister she leaves behind. I have already begun reading this and the writing style is beautiful. You become immediately entranced in this story and it is just great. So if you're interested in myth retellings, Greek god heroes, those kinds of things, this would probably be very much up your alley. That is it for all of the fantasy, sci-fi, and kind of related not present day basically books that I've got going on. Ooh, there they are. Okay, so now we can move on to the contemporaries. And if you thought there were a lot of books before now, there are a lot of contemporaries. And you guessed it, quite a few anticipated releases as well. Oh my goodness, what a month we are living in right now. Oh no. Oh, everything is fine. Next up, we have The Maidens by Alex Michaelides. Michaelides. All oh, raised in Cyprus. Yeah. Michaelides or Michaelides. Either one of those. Cyprus, probably. Yeah. So, this is a dark academia book that I have been waiting all year for. It is finally out, and I'm very excited about it anticipated release right here. So this is a spellbinding tale of psychological suspense weaving together Greek mythology, murder, and obsession. Dark academia, here we go. Edward Fosca is a murderer. Sweet. Of this, Mariana is certain. But Fosca is untouchable, a handsome and charismatic Greek tragedy professor at Cambridge University. Fosca is adored by staff and students alike, particularly by the members of a secret society of female students known as the Maidens. Mariana is a brilliant but troubled group therapist who becomes fixated on the Maidens when one member is found murdered in Cambridge. Mariana, who once herself a student at the university, quickly suspects that behind the idyllic beauty of the spires and turrets and beneath the ancient traditions lies something sinister. We're gonna leave it off at that and keep some suspense going because whoo, sounds fantastic. Next up is a book that I have been wanting to read for quite some time and I finally have my hands on a copy and that is The Atlas Six and this is written by Olivia Blake. This is about a group of six very powerful magical individuals also known as medians who were basically contacted from all over the world by the caretaker. The caretaker is the one who takes care of this Alexandrian society and basically takes these six most powerful individuals, gives them a set of tasks and research and watches over them for a year and then one of them is eliminated. And then those five go on to be very powerful individuals in the world. There are six main characters in this. They have a really wide set and interesting array of skills and magical abilities. And it looks at their six points of view throughout the story and how they connect with each other in this society and how they go through this research. Really fascinating, really interesting, and just a gosh darn good time, especially if you're into dark academia kind of things. These next two are pretty similar in their structure. They're both short stories slash essays about displaced individuals. The first one is The Displaced. This is a collection of refugee writers on refugee lives. I recently what read most of this during my 24 hour readathon. It is a collection that is edited by Viet Tan Wen and there are a wide array of stories featured in this from different individuals all around the world, migrants, refugees, asylum seekers who have experienced displacement and are either on a journey going from one place to another and all of the all of the terrible and most difficult things that they have to go through, but then there are also interspersed other stories that are highly connected but are from different perspectives. If you are at all interested in learning more about immigrant policy and actually how it affects immigrants and refugees, asylum seekers, migrants in general, definitely check out this collection. It is very phenomenal and compelling. Along that same line, I have this short story kind of essay. This is The Undocumented Americans. It is written by Carla Conejo Villaficiencio. She is basically telling her story about her being on DACA, but she is also telling the story of fellow undocumented Americans and 
making sure that they have the anonymity and the safe space to be able to tell their stories. A lot of times it's the difficulty about undocumented individuals sharing their stories because many times they aren't afforded or allowed or have the privilege to have anonymity with their stories. So fantastic. I have read about, I think, half of it. Yeah, I read about half of this collection so far and same goes from the other collection as for this one if you're at all interested in seeing the perspective of what it means to be undocumented in the United States of America and what people have to go through to try to get citizenship, to try to just be a resident and survive in this country, especially how DACA impacts migrants here absolutely check this out. This next one I have also been reading for quite some time and that is Hungry Hearts. This is a collection of 13 Asian authors who have written short stories that are placed in the same fictional universe which is really fascinating. It takes place in Hungry Hearts Row which is this little neighborhood and each of these stories you can see characters from previous of the short stories that were written in this collection and it all kind of ties together but not in a very obvious sense. You'll see characters in multiple stories, you'll see different events impacting multiple stories and it is just really fascinating. If you're interested in short story collections, I think honestly like it's always a mixed bag because there are 13 authors in here. You probably won't love all 13 stories or all 13 authors, but I think most cases you'll enjoy quite a bit of it and it's always a really interesting experience to see all of those collections written together. So this one is edited by Elsa Chapman and Carolyn Tung Richmond. It's honestly a good time. I have enjoyed most of the ones I've read in here. I think there was one that was just kind of a little boring for me, but all of the other ones I had a really good time. These are also really great since they're short stories to just kind of read one before lunch or read one in the morning. For this next one, I finally made the dive. I finally purchased the Raven Boys, the first book in the Raven Cycle by Maggie Steve Vatter. I have been terrified to purchase this book first off because this is one of those like YA classics that almost everyone has read. I have never known what the synopsis of this was until I read this. I technically did a kind of like guess the plot game slash challenge with Jade from Jaded Reader where I tried to guess the plot of this book, which is one of her favorite books of all time. And I have no idea what I said because I had no idea what this book was about. And even after she told me, I didn't know what this book was about. But now I'm about 30 pages in and I'm honestly really enjoying it. So it's basically about Blue who comes from this really clairvoyant family who every year they go to this graveyard and they speak to the dead of who are going to die in the next year. They find out what is going to be their cause of death, how will they die, and then people can come to them and ask them, you know, if they're gonna die that year. So, you know, a little morbid, but <laughs> good stuff and she sees this boy Gansey who goes to this local all boys school there. Yeah, and then I think there's some kind of road trip or something. I'm trying not to actually like read the back because I wanna be surprised because reading the first 30 pages, I was very surprised. But I've been terrified to read this book because two of my very close friends here on booktube, Olivia Savannah and Jade, really love this book. So I'm really scared that I won't love it, but so far I really am. So all good things. Next, I have another book from my Greek god reading TBR, and that is God's Behaving Badly. This is by Mary Phillips. The cover alone, my goodness. So this is about the 12 Greek gods of Olympus being alive and well, well, in the 21st century. They're crammed together in a London-style townhouse, and none of them are happy about it. Artemis is currently a professional dog walker. Aphrodite is a telephone sex operator. Apollo is a TV psychic. And then these two mortals come into their lives and turn their world absolutely upside down. It sounds like it'll be a wild ride. It sounds like a really interesting take on Greek gods. So I'll be interested to see where this goes. This next book I read as an arc last year. It was supposed to come out August of last year. It has come out in the last couple of months at some point, and I really, really loved this arc. I thought it was absolutely fantastic. I had it as an e-arc. I would love to have it on my shelves. I would love to talk about this book more. And that is I Think I Love You, and this is written by Arian Desombre. 
This book was honestly just really cute and I was able to finish it very quickly. It really pulled me in. But one of the main characters, Emma, is a diehard romantic and she really wants to write this really gay rom-com for a film festival competition. And then there's basically her enemy, Sophia, who is very pragmatic. She's really into boycotts and she really isn't into romance. She is into French cinema and all things very dramatic and serious. So when Emma ropes her friends into shooting this film project for this movie competition where she could get this really big scholarship, Sophia also gets roped into it and their ideas butt heads the entire time. The group ends up splitting up and just drama ensues. But there's also a really cute gay romance in here. So if you're interested in that, definitely check this out. I really loved this. And like this cover is just so flipping cute. I mean, come on. We still have a lot of books left. <laughs> in case you thought we were ending soon. No, we still got a lot left. So next I have Honey Girl by Morgan Rogers. I finished this in a couple of days. I started reading this when I got my first shot of Moderna. So I started reading this and I was like, it's gonna hit me at some point and it really didn't. So I read, I think most of this book. I read like 200 pages that day. This book sucks you in. It is so good. Oh my goodness. Okay, so it is about Grace Porter. She has recently completed her PhD in astronomy and then her best friends take her out to Vegas to celebrate. Except the next morning she wakes up and she realizes that she drunkenly married a girl that she had met the night before in Vegas. Now she goes home and she doesn't really know what to do. She married a complete stranger in Vegas. She barely even knows how to contact her. And she's also going through a lot of changes in her life. Since she just completed this PhD program, she's now looking for a full-time position. She has a lot of things going on with her family and she's just trying to find herself in the world around her. Next up, I have A Fall Love Story. This is written by Lonely. And I didn't love this book, but that was because of personal reasons. So if you are looking for a cute romantic story about rival families and their kids meeting up and finding a connection, then this story will probably be for you. The reason that I didn't enjoy it that much was because it did not at all mention that there was a large heavy theme of journalism going on in here. And I have worked in journalism. I really enjoyed my time in journalism, but I don't look for it in the books that I read because you don't really want to read about things that you have worked in if that maybe that's just me this is about the two main characters and their families who own competing pho restaurants and they are enemies since birth except one day they meet and they start writing these food reviews for restaurants because bao one of the main characters is in a journalism class and they start becoming a little closer, but they know that their parents would be pissed if they found out that they knew each other or they were talking. So they try to keep it secret, but then, you know, as time goes on, that means it is harder and harder to do so. So really cute story. It just wasn't for me because of the journalism. We have another anticipated release of this year. Oh my goodness. Jay's Gay Agenda by Jason June. I have been wanting to read this for so long. The cover, adorable. The synopsis, amazing. One of my friends, Maddie from Princess of Paperback, just recently finished reading the arc of this. Absolutely loved it. She was supposed to lend me the arc, but she loved it so much that she wouldn't part ways with the arc for me to lend it from her for a few weeks. So I have purchased the hardcover. <laughs> because I mean that alone tells you how fantastic this book is. So Jay is a statistical anomaly as the only out gay kid in his small rural town in Washington state. I lived in Washington state for quite some time. While all his friends can't stop talking about their heterosexual hookups and relationships, Jay can only dream of his own firsts, compiling a romantic to-do list of all of the things he hopes to one day experience, his gay agenda. Then against all odds, Jay's family moves to Seattle, the gay capital of Washington. <laughs> That's my own add-in. And he starts his senior year at a new high school with a thriving LGBTQIA plus community. For the first time ever, Jay feels like he's found where he truly belongs. But as Jay begins crossing off items from his list, he'll soon be torn between his heart 
and his hormone, his old friends and his new ones, because after all, life and love don't always go according to plan. I need, mm, I wanna read it so bad. I also requested an arc and was denied. <laughs> whatever it's fine but like it takes place in seattle i mean come on what more do you want we have another greek god retelling that i purchased that is lifestyles of gods and monsters and written this written by emily robertson i also got this from book outlet i think for like two dollars y'all get books from book outlet okay this one sounds this is the most whack greek myth retelling out of them all this is basically if you take a reality tv show with the hunger games and then toss in greek mythology and just put it in one of those salad spinners then you get this i mean it sounds bonkers 16 year old ariadne's whole life is curated and shared with the world her royal family's entertainment empire is all over social media beloved by the tabloids and the hottest thing on television the biggest money maker the labyrinth contest a tv extravaganza in which ariadne leads 14 teens into a maze to kill a monster to win means endless glory to lose means death mm. in 10 seasons no one has ever won which means for 10 years, 14 teens go into a maze and they die. <laughs> when the gorgeous and mysterious Theseus arrives at the competition and asks Ariadne to help him to victory, she doesn't expect to fall for him. He might be acting interested in her just to boost his own ratings. Sound familiar? The Hunger Games, y'all. Their chemistry is undeniable though, and she can help him survive. If he wins, the contest will end for good, but the monster will have to die, and for Ariadne, his life might be the only one worth saving. <sighs> Sounds interesting. This is um, one of my most recent purchases. I am so excited. It is, yet again, one of those anticipated releases of the year. I swear, my 21 most anticipated releases of 2021 is literally just all in this past month. I mean, don't look at me, look at the publishers, it's their fault, okay? I didn't do any of this. That is Last Night at the Telegraph Club, and this is written by Melinda Lowe. This, mm, mm, mm. I am so excited. A couple of my friends have already read this and so far have said it is as good as we all want it to be, which is so exciting. 16 year old Lily can't remember exactly what the question took root, but the answer was in full bloom the moment she and Kathleen walked under the flashing neon sign of a lesbian bar called the Telegraph Club. America in 1954 is not a safe place for two girls to fall in love, especially not in Chinatown. Red scare paranoia threatens everyone, including Chinese Americans like Lily. With deportation looming over her father, despite his hard earned citizenship, Lily and Kath risk everything to let their love see the light of day oh it sounds so good i want to read all of these books right now oh this pile is gonna fall next i have a book that i've been wanting to read for some time and i was able to get a hardcover edition of it so hello get a life chloe brown by talia hibbert everyone talks about this book Everyone says this book is fantastic. I have been wanting to read it for so long. I finally have a copy of it, which is so exciting. I barely even know what this book is about. I just know that it is phenomenal and it is romance and it is super cute and it is lighthearted and fluffy, but also deals with more serious topics. So let's check out this synopsis. Chloe Brown is a chronically ill computer geek with a goal, a plan, and a list. After almost but not quite dying, she comes up with seven directives to help her get a life. She's already completed the first, finally moving out of her glamorous family's mansion. The next items, enjoy a drunken night out, ride a motorcycle, go camping, have meaningless but thoroughly enjoyable sex, travel the world with nothing but hand luggage, and do something bad. But it's not easy being bad, even when you've written step-by-step -step guidelines on how to do it correctly. What Chloe needs is a teacher. She knows just the man for the job. Red is a handyman with tattoos, a motorcycle, and more sex appeal than 10,000 Hollywood heartthrobs. He's also an artist who paints at night and hides his work in the daylight, which Chloe knows because she spies on him occasionally. 
just a teeny bit and the story ensues from there oh my goodness it sounds really cute i can't wait all right the pile is diminishing slightly <laughs> next we have malibu rising by taylor jenkins reed i can't believe i have a copy of this i didn't I don't know this is just one of those things that you hear is going to come out sometime in the future and then all of a sudden you're holding it in your hands and you're like are you sure this is real ah. taylor jenkins reed wrote the seven husbands of evelyn hugo daisy jones and the six and a couple other works that i have not read yet i think like love interrupted might be one of them but this book actually involves a character that was in daisy jones and the six which is really exciting this is about the daughter of some Mick Riva. Yes. Okay, Mick Riva was mentioned in Davy Jones and the Six. He was like this big singer back in the 70s or 60s, maybe. And now it is about his daughter in Malibu, August of 1983. It's the day of Nina Rivera's annual end of summer party and anticipation is at a fever pitch. Everyone wants to be around the famous Rivera's. Nina, the talented surfer and supermodel, brothers Jay and Hud, one a championship surfer, the other a renowned photographer, and their adored baby sister Kit. Together, the siblings are a source of fascination in Malibu and the world over, especially as the offspring of legendary singer Mick Riva. We'll leave it at that because we love a bit of mystery and not knowing all of the plot, don't we? I'm so excited to read this. I am so excited to read this. I have heard great things about it and ah, only three books left oh my goodness one last stop by casey mcquiston another book that i just couldn't ever physically imagine holding in my hands and it being out because i've been hearing about this for more than a year for cynical 23 year old august moving to new york city is supposed to prove her right that things like magic and cinematic love stories don't exist and the only smart way to go through life is alone she can't imagine how waiting tables and a 24-hour pancake diner and moving in with too many weird roommates could possibly change that and there's certainly no chance of her subway commute being anything more than a daily trudge through boredom and electrical failures but then there's this gorgeous girl on the train. Cut it off right there. Leave some mystery to be discovered. This sounds adorable. It's very gay. We love to see it. Oh my goodness. It sounds fantastic. There's also like a weird time element going on with there. I don't want to know what it says about that in the synopsis because I want to be surprised. I hope it's good. I hope it's well done. I hope it's not weird. But I love when contemporaries have a little pinch of weird something funky that doesn't really make it a contemporary and makes it something that doesn't really match in the genre love that next up we have arsenic and adobo this is written by mia p manasala and this was either this is this month's pick for the full moon book club which is run by jan from jan agadon and i I'm really scared that I won't be able to read all of this before the book club live show. It's only 300 pages. I think I can do it. I just have been in such a reading slump for weeks now. So I hope I can just kind of like jumpstart, kick and start myself back into reading. The 24 hour readathon that I did already kind of helped with that, but I need a little more kick to get back into it. This is about Leela who moves back home to recover from a horrible breakup. Her life seems to be following all of the typical romance tropes, and she's tasked with saving her Tia Rosie's failing restaurant. She has to deal with a group of matchmaking aunties who shower her with love and judgment, but when a notoriously nasty food critic drops dead moments after a confrontation with her, her life quickly swerves into an Agatha Christie case. The cops are treating her like she's the one and only suspect and the shady landlord looking to finally kick them out and resell the storefront. She's left with no choice but to conduct her own investigation. It sounds cozy. It sounds fun. I love a little bit of a mystery in a contemporary and I really want to read it in time for the live show, but I'm I'm really afraid that I won't be able to make it. Now, this was going to be the last book on the list, but I actually literally just got a delivery notification that another book that I ordered is here. So I will quickly run downstairs after this one to grab that. 
but this is Better Together by Christine Ratio. So Christine, of course, is from the channel Pull In Bananas Books. I read her first debut novel last year, Again But Better. I read it as an ARC. I absolutely loved it. I have two copies of it, the Barnes & Noble exclusive and the standard edition. This is the Barnes & Noble exclusive edition of Better Together. I will most likely, almost for sure, get the standard edition as well, but I'm going to wait off because clearly I've already spent a lot of money on book purchases, so I'm going to I'm going to wait quite a while until I do that. But I am so excited for this book. Also, one of my most anticipated releases of this year, which is so exciting. I can't wait to read it. So this is basically Freaky Friday meets The Parent Trap. It is a sparkling heartfelt story about sisters who find each other and find themselves. So it is about Siri and Jamie. They're both sisters separated at a young age by their parents' divorce. They grew up living completely separate lives, Jamie with their dad and Siri with their mom. And now they are reunited, I think at this like find yourself camp, like kind of, you know, Parent Trap style, they meet there and then they switch places due to like a weird like semi-magical contemporary funky situation thing something like that they both have completely different personalities this is siri and this is jamie and oh my gosh i can't wait i just realized there's another book that's missing from this stack as well that i need to find and I have no idea where it is. So I need to find a book and I need to get the book that was just delivered. Okay, one, two, three, go team. So I swear I have looked absolutely everywhere and I cannot find my copy of the Anthropocene Reviewed. I have looked everywhere in my apartment. I cannot find it. So let me briefly talk about the Anthropocene Reviewed, the new nonfiction written by John Green. So this is based off of the podcast by the same name, the Anthropocene Reviewed. I have been listening to it since 2018 when it started. It is my favorite podcast of all time. The podcast episodes come out about once a month. I love it so much. It is rating many things on the human-centered planet on a five-star scale. It is, of course, in that sense, making fun of the five-star scale reviewing system, which I think is hilarious because then people review the book based off of the five-star scale and it is just very meta kind of funny and ironic. <laughs> so I absolutely love it. There are multiple essays and reviews on many different things like refrigerators or the O'O -Oh bird in Hawaii, which I think was a wonderful episode. You can also listen to all the podcast episodes for free on a podcast app. And that one made me cry. Um, many of them have made me cry. I absolutely love this collection so much. I am taking my sweet time with it because most of it is basically rereading because I have listened to all of the podcast episodes, but there are a few new reviews and stories in this one. If you have read any of John Green's previous work and either loved it or didn't love it at all, that I don't think reading any of his past work, however you felt about it, would have any impact on how you read this work because it is entirely different from any of his fictional work and of course his last work was written quite a while ago. My battery is now flashing so I will stop talking about John Green, I will talk about this last book. So very quickly the last book I have is The Wicker King. This is written by Kay Ancrum and this is the book club pick for the Buy Book Club. I recently found out that there is a Buy Book Club and I am so excited. I had no idea. Yasmin from, I believe Yasmin B. Readin told me about it and I am so excited. I really want to read this before the next live show which I am afraid I might not have enough time but I know nothing about this book, I just know that it is bisexual and it has a really cool like ongoing thing where the pages go from dark to light. Of course now I'm showing it backwards, but it looks fascinating and I can't wait to read it. So that was it for my giant book haul. This was about 42 books, I think. It's fine, I got most of them discounted, used, or something of the like. This was a huge new release month. I was so excited about all of these releases. Thank you so much for watching. If you have read any of these, let me know. Let me know what your recent book purchase was and I will see you in the next one. Thank you so much for watching and I hope you have a wonderful day. Bye.